This video is part of a larger series of videos on the Japanese expansion in the Far East during the Second World War. Search this channel for the Second World War in the Far East playlist for the other episodes. The Japanese invasion of Malaya had been a steady advance of victory upon victory, with very few exceptions until the clash with the Australian 2nd 30th Battalion at Gemas on the 14th of January 1942. The Australian ambush had caused large casualties on the Mukaidi detachment, but Japanese reinforcements had caused the ambushes to fall back onto their brigade positions. While the Australians held the area to the east, the coastal area around the town of Muar was held by the Indian 45th Brigade, supported by a single battery of artillery. This position was held by three battalions, but they were spread out from the coast into the jungle, and this had an impact on their communication lines. The 45th Brigade was part of General Gordon Bennett's West Force. Reinforcements had also arrived in the form of the British 53rd Infantry Brigade. This formation had been at sea for 11 weeks and was unfit for deployment immediately. Facing the defence line was the advancing Imperial Guard Division commanded by General Nishimura. The 4th and 5th Guards Regiments approached Miu from the north, whilst a battalion-sized force commanded by Colonel Ogaki approached from the sea. During the night of 15th of January, the Japanese captured boats and barges from the southern banks of the Miu River. These boats were then packed with soldiers who crossed the river with no resistance, except for an exchange of shots with an Indian patrol. The patrol didn't alert the Muar garrison to the presence of the Japanese soldiers, and as day broke on the 16th, several other Indian companies were either routed or captured by the Japanese. An entire division of Japanese soldiers had crossed the river without the garrison realising the danger. By noon, the Japanese were attacking Muar town from upstream and threatening the garrison's lines of communication, and the 4th 9th Jat Regiment, which was the only local reserve located near Bakri. In Muar town, the Japanese attempt to seize the harbour was repulsed by Australian artillery, which fired at the packed junks and barges as they crossed the river mouth. The Japanese had made another landing further upstream and were already infiltrating into Muar town itself by mid-afternoon. In the fighting, the commanders and officers of the Rajputana and Royal Garwal rifles had been killed, leaving the young sepoys leaderless. Added to this, a Japanese air raid destroyed the 45th Brigade headquarters, killing all but two of the officers. The commander of 45th Brigade, Brigadier Herbert Duncan, was concussed but was one of the men who survived. With the destruction of the headquarters and the Brigadier being concussed, commander of the 45th Brigade was temporarily taken over by Anderson of the 2nd 19th Australian Battalion. By nightfall on the 16th of January, the Japanese had captured Muar Town and the harbour whilst the remnants of 45th Brigade retreated down the coast several kilometres. The Japanese wasted no time and organised ambush positions to the south of the town in case of any counter-attacks. On the 17th of January, the remaining units of the 45th Brigade with the 2nd 19th and the 2nd 29th Australian Battalions as reinforcements were dispatched to recapture Muar. The Allies rallied around Bakri and threw up a rough perimeter defence. Brigadier Duncan, backing command of the 45th Brigade, planned a three-pronged advance against the town on the main road, coastal road and the jungle island. However, the 45th ran into one of the Japanese ambush locations and the attack was cancelled. At 6.45 in the morning on the 18th, General Nishimura ordered a three-prong attack against Bakri. This was spearheaded by eight Type 95 Hago light tanks, commanded by Captain Gutanda. Defending the road was the 2nd 29th Australian Battalion, with three companies and two anti-tank guns waiting in the rubber plantations. Taking his inspiration from the successful tank attack at the Slim River, Captain Gutanda advanced with 12 infantry support against the 2nd 29th Australian Battalion. The first wave of five tanks attacked under the cover of mortar fire. Three were immediately engaged by the forward gun, but continued their attack. The anti-tank rounds passed straight through the tanks, so Sergeant Thornton, commanding the forward gun, switched to high explosive shells, which destroyed three of the Japanese tanks. With support from the 2nd anti-tank gun, commanded by Sergeant Parsons, the final two tanks were destroyed and the escaping crew were machine-gunned by a Vickers. At 7.15, three more tanks advanced, undeterred by the previous failed attack. These three also came under fire from the Australian anti-tank guns and were soon destroyed. As a result of the action, Sergeant Clary Thornton was mentioned in dispatches and Sergeant Charles Parsons was awarded the DCM for their part in stopping the Japanese advance. Thornton's gun had fired over 70 rounds during the fighting. However, the commander of 2nd 29th Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel John Robertson, was killed in the engagement. The Japanese were not expecting to lose a company of tanks that morning, and without the support of armour, the Japanese infantry were unable to break through the Australian lines. However, despite this local Allied victory, the Japanese were making gains elsewhere. On the 19th of January, the Japanese were in action on the main road, and had almost surrounded the 45th Brigade. 
The line of retreat for the 40th Brigade was covered by the 6th Norfolk Battalion of the 53rd British Brigade on the ridge, about 8 kilometres west of Yongpeng. A Japanese attack by two battalions of the 4th Imperial Guards drove the defenders from their positions. The Norfolks had no wireless and were unable to inform their headquarters of their new positions on the North Ridge. At dawn on the next day, the 3rd 16th Punjabs were ordered to take back control of the Japanese positions. The Punjabs were commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Henry Moorhead. As they advanced, they came under fire from the Norfolks, who had mistaken them for Japanese soldiers. Heavy casualties were caused before the confusion was sorted out, and then the Japanese attacked the ridge before a proper defence could be organised. Moorhead was killed, and the Norfolks and Indians were pushed off their positions once again. The Japanese capture of the ridges threatened to cut off 45th Brigade and the two Australian battalions. Later on that day, Brigadier Duncan was killed whilst commanding the rear guard and leading a bayonet charge to recover captured vehicles. With the commander now dead, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Anderson took control of the remains of 45th Brigade and the other units around Bakri. On the morning of the 20th, Anderson was ordered to pull out of the Bakri positions and attempt to fight their way through to Yongpeng. A delay to the retreat whilst waiting for the 4th 9th Jats to join the column meant that the 2nd 29th Australians were cut off from Anderson's position. About 200 men from the Australian battalion and 1,000 Indian men from the 45th Brigade were able to join up with the column. Other survivors of the 2nd 29th Battalion made it back in small parties. Two kilometres south of Bakri, Anderson's column was held up by a Japanese roadblock, which was only cleared after a bayonet charge led by Anderson himself. By evening, the column had only progressed five kilometres due to other Japanese roadblocks. Unfortunately for the soldiers, rest was out of the question, and although the passage south was now easier in open country, the men were laden with wounded, slowing progress. The 45th Brigade had practically ceased to exist. Most of the officers were either killed or wounded, including Brigadier Duncan and all three battalion commanders. Lieutenant General Percival commented that the young Indian recruits were helpless. They did not even know how to take cover, and there were not enough officers to control them. I say this in no spirit of disparagement. It was a penalty of years of unpreparedness for war coming out in all its stark nakedness.